Good morning and welcome to our Live Talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our Live Talk program covering wisdom for living on this year Friday morning. Rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, I'm looking at a topic, avoid being presumptuous. Preparation is not a denial of fate. Preparation is not a denial of fate. So welcome again. Hopefully you had a blessing night rest and you're ready to take on this day, top of the morning to you. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of your word this day. The blessings, dear Lord, of being able to understand the importance of a faith that works. May you be with us and bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. So we're looking here at avoid being presumptuous. Preparation is not a denial of faith. And um, we're closing off this thought here. I'm going to be more leaning health-wise um, this morning, but um, the principle will kind of cl clarify and close out some of the thoughts that I was sharing this week. So I'm trying to wrap it up here and summarize some things. So in dealing with the problems of life, in dealing with the problems of life, it is important to use all means available to get good results, to stubbornly reject methods that will bring relief to a problem is foolish. Our focus is health but um, for this program, but this can be applied to social, political, spiritual, moral, natural problems. Why would a country or an individual reject known methods for success only to use one method? And so why would you do this as an individual? Why would a country do this? If you have other means of being able to be successful, to be able to accomplish certain things, then you use all means available. You use whatever at your disposal to be able to get a good result. And so in life, often you see this happen and repeat itself over and over again when individuals, we hear of a method and they only consider one method. And if somebody's doing something over there and it's different from what they're doing, you know, in our modern world, they'll say, well, it's not scientific and it can't be proven by a double blind placebo, cross, crossover, randomized study. Um, it cannot be accepted in any way and cannot be used can it be trusted? Uh, but many of these methods, especially when we talk about natural health, have been in use for thousands of years and people are still alive. <laughs> they used it and they did not have any double blind randomized trial to just know that if you have this problem, you use this herb and it fixed the problem. And they use it and it work. But somebody will be like, nope, I can't, I'm blind to it and I prefer to die or suffer and in pain and just suffering all kinds of afflictions and not say, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to be so close-minded. And I've noticed this um, in many aspects of life. And one of the things I've noticed is that you could have a person who is rich, have double PhD, you know, the brightest mind the world has ever seen, and they can be so close-minded. And it's the same on the same breath, you could have somebody that's very poor and um, very ignorant, probably cannot read or write. And they too can be very close-minded. Close-mindedness doesn't... Um, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what your intellectual status is. It's just a matter of are you curious, are you willing to try? And so the problem, my theme again this week is the problem with building success from unrighteous gain. And I've been analyzing this week um, the corrupt financial rise of China and the pain it's been dishing out worldwide and the problem with building an empire on the suffering of others. And so although this morning here, or this talk here, if you listen to me in the evening, will not be um, focused per se on this, but if you keep that thought in mind, that theme in mind, you'll hear me addressing it kind of sideways without focusing on it. So here we go. I'm going to go back now to our text, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13 through 17. Jeremiah 22, verse 13 through 17. And it says, Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteous gain, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. So if you notice here, the person who is doing this think that the only way to success, as I said on Monday, is to do it this way. And if somebody come along and do it another way, they're so close-minded to it that they're like, oh, no, I can't do it like that. I have to basically use people to make money. You know, if you say to a group of people right now um, that you probably should bail out for the first time in history, um, the poor people, and forget about the big guys, they already got their bailout over and over again. They'll be like, oh, no, you can't do that. That would be like socialism or something like that. And, you know, they become blind and foolish to that. 
But, you know, do, you can do something different. Because if you keep doing the same thing and you keep having financial crashes, well, probably you should consider, well, why why we try this other method over here? You know, the Bible does talk about that in the time of the Jubilee or the sabbatical, you you help out the poor, the fatherless, the widow, those who are strangers. Probably we should try that this one time and see how it would work. But when you have a closed-minded society that anything like, oh, no, we can't use this, then they move to methods that is keep giving them the same bad result and everybody before them the same bad result, but they're blinded to the opportunities that are lied there. So notice here um, in verse 14 it says, that said, I will build me a wide house and a large chamber and cut it him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Shall thou reign, because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and, and needy. When it, then it was well with him. Um, was not this to know me, says the Lord? But thine eyes and thine heart are but for thy covetousness and for to shed innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. So here's a person, as the Bible is describing um, here, Jeremiah is describing, who has a method that he does and he's doing it because of just a wicked heart. And if you go to this person, they're convinced that this is the only method would work. And as I say, in your personal life or in um, you watch a country, you can see how this can play out. That a person can be so locked up and just rejecting of certain information because they just believe, no, no, that can't work. You know, uh, it's, it's funny sometimes to watch a person, you're t saying something to them and then you say, hey, you know, I believe in God and I believe that's God that worked this situation out this way. And you can see the person demean a change. <laughs> You're like, no, I don't want to hear about that. I, I just believe it's chance. And I recently said that to somebody and they say, uh, they were just fascinated. That, uh, you can see the, the face lit when I was explaining the sequence of events and how things happen. And, you know, I did not go say, I believe it's the mercy of God. And you just see the, the like the shoulder, the face has drop. Like, why are you saying that? And then the person said to me, well, it's probably just chance. <laughs> and I'm like, man, it's a whole bunch of chance sequence of event. But we go with that. Uh, see you later. <laughs> So this this year is, you know, it's just, it has to be this way and this way only. So in life, um, we don't take this type of attitude. Um, we, um, we, but there's other issues at play here. So with all that said, I'm going to go to now uh, this issue that I wanted to look at and share with you. Uh, that I think is a very important issue. Now, this issue here is that since this virus has been running, right? Since this virus has been running, uh, I, I wasn't paying attention to what the preachers are saying. But I keep on hearing people use Psalms 91. You know, they will say they're going to claim Psalm, Psalm 91. I would see it, um, other people tell me that people have claimed it um, to them. You know, say that they aren't going to worry about it. I guess they probably still wash their hands and stuff, but they're going to claim Psalms 91. And then I went and checked and then I saw that there's preachers online who are preaching Psalms 91. So basically, they're saying, according to Psalms 91, the Lord will protect you. So Psalms 91 in itself can be used as a, I see as a text to deny faith. So I wanted to explore for the rest of our time here. I'm going to explore this concept here of Psalms 91 about the Lord will protect you and be people dropping dead all around you and you'll be fine. And then... um. After that, then I'm going to just go to talk about what you need to do to take care of yourself. I'm going to do a quick overview of what you need to do to take care of yourself for corona, coronavirus. What are the basic things that you have to do? And for this influenza, the same thing. The solutions are the same. For influenza or for coronavirus, for any type of respir respiratory tract infection, even if you had COPD or anything like that, it's the same process you would use. So I'm going to go over that the second half. So the next few minutes here now, I'm going to deal with this issue that have been floating around amongst a lot of the mainland preachers and a lot of people claiming Psalms 91. So just in case you're not familiar with what Psalms 91, when I read it for you, you know it's a very popular text in Christianity. Uh, here we go. Psalms 91 verse 1. 
He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And we say of the Lord, He is my refuge, praise the Lord, and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. I have a very powerful experience with this text as a child. It's a text that has been riveted in my mind. So I find it fascinating when we talk about coronavirus that this text is the one that's being brought up. Notice here, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall die sorry, his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So I'll pause there. So notice there there's a supernatural protection that God gives the righteous. And then also he didn't mess up. He didn't mess up. Psalms, this is inspired writing. Notice the truth is thrown in there. Now, normally when people are using Psalms 91 day, don't reference his truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So the question then, is it the supernatural protection of God or is it truth? Or could it be that their C is the answer, not A, not B, but C. C is both. It's supernatural protection and it's truth. I'll get back to that later. Just keep that in mind. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night. You can't see it. You're dealing with something that it is dangerous, but you cannot see it. And when we talk about viruses, that is exactly what we're seeing. Unless a person is manifesting symptoms, a virus is normally in a person. If it's not, they're not showing symptoms, you can catch it, but it's in darkness. You cannot see it. So this can be easily applied truly, properly to viruses and even bacteria because they're microscopic, you can't see it. It is not just the devil and the demons that you can't see, but you can't see literally bacteria and viruses. So I'll read it again. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flight by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted at noonday. So if you see this here, the pestilence that walketh in darkness. As I say, pestilence walk in darkness because again, you cannot see. You know there's a pest going around. There's something transferring from somebody. If a person cough, you, you can't see pestilence in the cough. You can't see an outbreak in that cough, but it's there. And God says, look, don't worry about it. I can see it. You're under my wings and you live by my truth. I will bless you. Notice here the big text now that you're familiar with. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. So this is the main verse here that is being used a lot. The whole chapter you claim it, but as Christians, we, we do claim this. But not in the way I notice it's being used. Notice here, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. So imagine you're walking like David through the valley of the shadow of death, and there's pestilence, and there's destruction that you can't see, and it's wasting people. People are getting wasted, dropping like flies, and ten, a 1,000 at your side, and 10,000 at thy right hand. Don't touch you. Don't touch you. So, this is important to claim when there's something going around that you cannot see, but it's making people drop like flies. Verse 8, holding back from commenting, I'll get to it in a second. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So you will look and you see the wicked, as I was covering this week, the wickedness that's been going on, and you'll see the reward of the wicked. So we understand that this is tied to wickedness. People doing wicked things and then the pestilence and the destruction come. The arrow fly by day. Verse 9 says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So you remember the story of Exodus, when it was time for the firstborn of the Egyptian to die because they had murdered the firstborn of the Hebrews. As long as they had the blood over the doorposts. See, they still had to do something with the blood. The blood wasn't going to get there miraculously. They still had to go there, slay the animal, take the blood, 
and then put it on the doorpost. And if they made a cross or whatever they did with it. And they put that blood on the doorpost. And when it was time for the death, death, death angel to pass by, as long as that blood was there, they were covered. So still, this, this text does not evoke this idea that you do nothing, as my topic is, avoid being presumptuous. Avoid being presumptuous. Preparation is not a denial of faith. So if they believe in Jesus in the time of the death of the firstborn, and they did not put that blood of a doorpost. It wouldn't matter. They still would have their firstborn um, killed by the death, death angel. So it's important to notice that. So I'll read it again. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So we have a plague running right now. And it's not come by, by dwelling. Because the blood is upon you, right? We have plagues with heroin. We have plagues with opiates. Various different opiates. We have plagues with meth. We have plagues with drugs. And alcohol, all kind of plagues running right now, killing all many. We have an up, up, obesity epidemic. It's a plague, it's a scourge on a society. And the Bible promised that this obesity epidemic shall not come near your dwelling. Uh, verse 11 says, let me just go back here. Verse 11 says, For he shall give his angel charge over thee, thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up. In their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So keep that text in mind. And in verse 13, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, and young lion and dragon shall thou tread under thy feet. Dragon, you know, could also be interpreted as serpents. Serpents and dragon are the same thing. If you know the Chinese, they celebrate the dragon. So he's saying here, the serpent, you may be straight up on it and will not damage you. Many people have used this text and the reference to this text in the New Testament to handle serpents and have been bitten and killed. And yeah, verse 14, because he, had, because he had set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he had known me. So this is talking about reference to Christ, but it's a good reference also to the righteous because they have set their love upon God. But we know over the years and over the millennia, or millennia, um, not the millennium, that many uh, prophets were murdered and God did not stop their murder. One of the most prominent ones would be John the Baptist. So somebody will say, well, how does this sex apply? We'll get there in a second. Uh, verse 15 and 16, Now he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So this is this powerful Psalms 91. Psalms 91, very powerful. And the main claim that people have in Psalms 91 is in verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. So when we look at this, um, this te text here is one of the most powerful texts to be presumptuous with. Um, all Most of the verses here is being used for people to be presumptuous. Presumption is that they presume that this is going to be the end result and they go and, you know, uh, I say it this way. They are told not to do something or to avoid something and they bold face it, go forward and say, God is with me, God is going to protect me. And they walk into, into a trap, they walk into trouble presuming that god is going to protect them from the trouble and then when things fall apart and they get a beat down they're shocked or they're dead so this text here is one of the texts to use to make people go into situations and then looking for a testimony and all the time the testimony is that they got maimed or killed and so now i want to look now with you i'm going to read one more text it's a non text of presumption it's one of the big presumptuous texts is in isaiah 54 verse 17. this is one more of these texts that you can use to be foolish in our words you know they can tell you all day long you need to protect yourself and you can say i ain't gonna protect myself i'm not gonna stop fornicating or i'm not gonna buy a condom and then you pick up some std you know, this, this is not a text. Notice here, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. So we pause here at the cold, semicolon. Uh, this again, Isaiah 54, verse 17, is one of the big um, texts that is used for presumption. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. So say the coronavirus was uh, by a weapon. So somebody could say, well, this is a weapon that was formed against 
us and it shall not prosper. So this now could mean if, if you know that somebody's against you, trying to poison you, you could go ahead and eat food from them. You see, you, you could use this text in that way. And you say, God says, he'll protect me. Um, you know trouble. So remember, the text in the New Testament says in Matthew um, 6, it says, we should pray every day that the Lord deliver us from temptation and from evil. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. That's our prayer. So even the Lord's prayer is opposite of you walking into known trouble. So we'll talk a little bit more. So let's read again verse 17 of Isaiah 54. Notice here, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that rise against thee in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. So this text I'll deal with before I get back to Psalms 91, especially verse 17. So notice here it says, No weapons formed against you shall prosper. Everyone that comes up in judgment and go against you shall fail. And this is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. Now this again has to be juxtaposed with Christ's teaching because Christ says, Whenever you're persecuted, your first option is to flee. Because you'll be dragged into synagogues and into courtrooms and so forth to be persecuted but your fir up first option is to get out of town so you could ignore that teaching and say hey look see no weapon form against me and whatever in judgment also christ teaches that if somebody trying to take you into judgment even when you're right you didn't do anything wrong your first option is to try to settle the matter before you go to court because you don't want to get into trouble you always move to try to settle and go to the person who you have ought with, Matthew chapter 18. And you take Matthew chapter 18, comes and deal with a person that has a problem with you. But you could say, oh, no weapon form against Michelle Foster. No. You see, you, you, you do what Christ says. No, here's the thing. I always say you have to look at a text and then look at how it plays out in reality. Because remember, Christ, there was weapons formed against John the Baptist and he died. There was weapons formed against many of the prophets and they died. They were, they were given a false. The righteous often find themselves in situations where they were accused falsely and the accusers won. Now, ultimately, their name were vindicated and justified. But often, we're not given eternal life here right now. So we could die by false accusers. Now, later on, it will come out that it was false accusation. You see so many people being let, let off the Innocence Project and these wicked prosecutors have been shamed. But when they did it, they got away with it. So it doesn't mean I say you couldn't go in death row, falsely, being falsely accused, and die. And then later on you get justified, but you're dead. So one has to look at these texts and, and be careful in other words. If anything I'm saying here, as I say my topic is avoid being presumptuous. Preparation is not a denial of fate. You prepare. You see, we're not boldly running into a situation we make sure we study, we be careful, and we look and analyze and say, okay, I see what's going on. I know what I need to do. I need to prepare these ways. Or I need to get out of that dodge. I need to flee. You got you to gotta know. You can't say, oh God, no weapon form against me shall prosper. And then run foolishly. Now, back to, I'm going to read again, Matthew, I mean, Psalms 91 and verse 7. Hopefully I laid some foundation there. So now Psalms 91 verse 7 again. I'm going to deal with now this, this text. Now notice here, A thousand shall fall by at thy side, and ten, ten, thousand, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. And I want you to focus also on verse 11 and 12. Notice it says here, For he shall give his angel charge over thee to keep in all thy ways, all thy ways. They shall bear thee up, in their hand, hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. All right, you see that? Now go with me now, if you're following, if you're listening to me, I'm going to go now to Matthew 4, verse 5 through 7. Matthew 4, verse 5 through 7. Now what we're going to see here is that Satan knows well that when he was going to tempt Christ, he needed to tempt Christ with Psalms 91. So Psalms 91 is critical. Satan knows that it's a trip up. And he tried to trip the Lord up, but the Lord overcome him with a dust, says the Lord. So many people claim Psalms 91, but they never talk about Matthew 4, 
verse 5 through 7 and say to people, be careful because the devil uses this to cause you to kill yourself, so to speak, or to be careless. Notice here, Matthew 4, verse 5 through 7. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. So I pause there. Basically, throw yourself down. Normally, in a normal situation, you murder yourself. Right? This is an act that is going to happen two ways. It's either you're going to get saved, because that's what Psalms 91 claim, or you're going to kill yourself. He basically saying to the Son of Man, attempt suicide and then see if God catch you. See, that goes against Christ's teaching about thou shalt, you know, deliver me from evil. <laughs> and, um, and leave me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. But you're not going to deliver yourself from evil and say, God, catch me. And I've seen people say that to me. Lord, I'm just going to fall and then God have to catch me. And then when God not catch them, they become very disillusioned. And they're disillusioned with a false premise. The devil tempt them, really. So notice here, I'm going to read again verse 6. And he said unto him, this is the devil now said, If thou be the son of God, if thou be the son of God, Cast thyself down. Because we know Psalm 91 is really talking about you, Jesus. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest any at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. So he literally quote verse 11 and 12. He knows his subject. You know, hey, people like to claim this text and be foolish, and I like to kill them with this text. So he quotes it in Christ, and notice what Christ answered in verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Some translation will give you, Thou shalt not test God. Don't tempt God. Don't say, God, hey, deliver me. I'm going to drop over here. You call, catch me because I'm yours, Jesus. So this text teaches, Christ's response to that is like, Don't tempt the Lord. Don't say, I'm not going to drink water. But I'm going to be healthy. You're tempting God. Don't say I'm not going to prop, follow, prop, follow proper principles and protocols. And God going to deliver. Because I'll be foolish. You prepare. You make the right preparation that is available to human beings. You do what human beings have the ability to do. God gave us a brain to use. God gave us history. God gave us nature. God gave us his Bible. Use your brain. But don't say, I'm going to ignore And I've known people do this. Say, I'm praying. I'm waiting on the Lord. And I say, hey, look, you can come over here and do this thing. And they'll be like, no, I, I want to, I'm going to pray to God and say, if God approve of that. Or God. Like, bro, do this. This is na nature. This is natural. And they'll avoid doing the thing that makes sense. But they'll still be praying. And then they go ahead and do something wrong. And then they get a whooping. They get a whooping, a big whooping. And then they say, oh, I'm depressed. Because I, I didn't do the obvious. And I was waiting for God to deliver me. And I went right in the head and be presumptuous. Jesus said, don't tempt God. Because, you know, God might not catch you. And then what? Don't tempt me. So notice it, Christ says again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So I'm going to read again just for you to get this because this is very important because in these times of trouble, you're going to hear a lot of people claiming Psalms 91. And you need to direct them to Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, to the word of Jesus and show them how Jesus used Psalms 91. He didn't use it carelessly. If you did all your preparation and you did the best you can and with all you know, you did your research and things still fall apart, then you say, God, I'm claiming Psalms 91. Because remember, I'm going to read these two parts. First here, I'm going to bring it back to verse 4. Notice it says, He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall, he, shall thou trust. People like to use this verse also, but they really kind of gloss over the other half of the verse, which is, His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So the question is, is it his wings or is it the, 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 the truth? I believe it's both. For what you need divine deliverance, God will come through for you. But what is revealed as truths, you need to apply them. You can't 
lock your mind up and say, I'm not going to do anything. And I, as I say, I'm using for the rest of the talk, I'm going to use health as an example. I reject any health principle. And God's going to deliver me. I'm going to pray. I'm okay prayed up. I'm going to get a prayer warriors. That's being foolish. The, this, this verse here says both things apply. The, the cover of the feathers, that means you have a canopy of protection above you. And the truth as your buckling shield, what is a buckling shield is doing? It's protecting your midsection. It's protecting your gut from spill out. You get some protection when the arrow fly by day and the pestilence by night. You get some protection. But it's truth. So truth revealed, truth available to the masses. There's nothing I'm preaching here and teaching here ever. It is not something that you can go. Notice I, um, I, I never, I don't even know if I ever, I only quote major sources. I purposely do that. I quote the Bible, I quote the Spirit of Prophecy, and I quote major online sources or any other sources. Because I'm just saying basically, if I'm reading it, you have it. So if you're not practicing it and then you're claiming Psalms 91, you will die as a fool and your blood shall be upon your head because it's both the divine providence of God and protection via himself and his angels and also the truth. Truth reveal is for you and I. We can't ignore those truths. And then it says, oh, I'm claiming Psalms 91. I'm claiming verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right, but it shall not come ninety. You can't have... You can't, you can't ignore the health message and have high blood pressure and are the coronary artery problem, not addressing it. You can't say, I'm going to stay obese. You can't say, I'm going to have a kidney problem, a liver problem, all these things. And then says, oh, I'm going to claim Psalms 91 verse 7 and I'm not going to do nothing. I'm going to claim this and when the disease come, I'm going to be okay. And I'm like, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to make sure you remind your family, go say goodbye. Um, so this is important to note. You make your preparation. You do what is humanly possible and leave divine possible things to God. And don't tempt God. Don't tell God that he need to do this for you. Because God said, man, you know, today the jig is up. I'm tired of you and your nonsense. Uh, notice again, Satan had quoted verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angel charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So Satan, no, oh yeah, we have these crazies going around quoting this. Let me try this one. And he tried it and Jesus like, no, I'm going to give you a text. Well, you give me a text, I'll give you a text. So that you don't try to trap me in foolish talk. And I'm, again, for, although I'm not running low on time here, I'll say this. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder and young lion and the dragon, or you could say serpent, shall thou tr trample under feet so this is another text that people use if you you can go online and just go probably on youtube and you can see documentaries where um, preachers look at this text and then christ using this text in the new testament and they'll use the, the statement of christ and this text and they'll go handle snake handle the snake uh, adder is a very poisonous snake a lion is something that can eat you. Young lion, he has a lot of power. And they say, oh, this text tells me I need to go play with them. I need to go kiss them. And there's a situation where you can see the documentaries where preachers have been murdered by themselves, self-murder. But they won't say suicide. They'll say, I was following the Bible. The Bible said, I'm supposed to take a cobra, put it in my mouth and kiss it. <laughs> I can't imagine. Whack. I am bite onto you i can imagine church service must be like popping off that day that, that has to be one of the most exciting church service when people start to jump up and down <laughs> and get in the spirit of excitement <laughs> when the snake bite on uh, this is not what the text is saying don't tempt the lord i uh, don't tempt the lord but you know the hope is that if you unbeknownst to yourself come upon a snake then you know that's a different story we pray for divine deliverance. Uh, don't be messing about with lions. We have people who are the professionals and they've been bitten and killed by these lions. And they've, they are the lion from a child. The lion are from a, what do you call it? A, a, it's not a pup. <laughs> Whatever a, a baby lion is. 
uh, a little kitten, and and you and trained it, and yet still one by slight move, a lion bite onto their neck. Those animals, these cats, they like to bite you in your neck. And somebody say, oh, but the Lord says my protection. So I move on for the sake of time. Worthy of more discussion. But I have more I want to share with you here. So Matthew chapter, sorry. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse. Deuteronomy 6. Now I'm just going to read for you for the sake of continuity. Where Christ um, claim or quotes this idea, don't tempt the Lord. Uh, so notice here in verse Deuteronomy 6 verse 15 and 16. It says, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempt him in Massa. So in Deuteronomy here, um, it says, this is where Christ was quoting from, don't tempt the Lord, right? Don't, don't, don't try the Lord. Don't test the Lord. You know, we as, I was going to say we as parents, but parents have observed, <laughs> will often say, don't test me, child. Don't tempt me. Don't don't try me. Because you might push to see how merciful I am and how kind I am. And I might get fed up with you and give you a whooping. All right. And this this is remember we're made in the image of God. Don't be knowing that you're supposed to do something and then, oh, call for the prayer wires. Pray for me. I'm about to drop dead here in the hospital. God says, Look, don't tempt me. I'll make you drop dead. You know what you need to do. You're not doing it. I'll read it again. Verse 16. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempt him in Massa. So what is he talking about in Massa? In Exodus chapter 17, verse 2 and 3. Exodus 17, verse 2 and 3. It says, Wherefore, the people chied with Moses. So they're arguing with Moses. Man, you, why are you doing this? Why are you you're getting on top of my last nerves here? Basically, that's what they're doing. And, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Where do ye, wherefore do you tempt the Lord? So their murmuring, murmuring was a temptation. And it's if you if you read First Corinthians chapter ten, you see that there it says that the people murmured and the Lord started to basically swat them like swat them like flies. Because their unfaithfulness, they know the deal, they know the process. But they just like to talk bad. Notice here verse 33. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses. So the issue didn't come and say, you know, Lord has been so good to us. He delivered us. Um, could you ask the Lord for some water? We kind of thirsty here. They sort of chide Moses. Started becoming disrespectful. And what happened? And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Very disrespectful, very ungrateful, very unfaithful, and just just not right for them to start saying that, start to apply evil motives to Moses, saying, oh, Moses brought us here. The Lord that delivered so much. Oh, you brought us here. You and God brought us here to murder us. And this became a big sin for Israel. Even that activity is you tempting God. Like, why are you saying that? God's going to take care of you. So hopefully that's very clear. We, we don't tempt God. We don't say, I'm going to walk in the, in, the, in the lines then. You know, Daniel wasn't... wasn't didn't walk into the that line, then he got cast into the lines then. We don't go into lines then and say, God says he's going to deliver me. That's your tempting God. And God going to make you get eaten. You don't do that. You know, many people say, oh yeah, like Daniel, we need to work in the king's palace. Daniel was brought captive into the king's palace. We have to be careful that we don't get swallowed by all this political foolishness. And we, 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 we take on things that begin on ourselves and then we get eaten. There's a lot of situations that people use Psalms 91 to tempt God instead of doing what they know is best to be done. I'm going to read this quotation here, one of the books I play here on Revival Form Radio, which is the book called Ministry of Healing, written by Ellen G. White, written over 100 years ago. Notice here, she's talking about this idea here. Notice here it says, uh, Those who seek healing by prayer should not neglect to make 
use of the remedial agencies within their reach. It is not a denial of fate to use such remedies as God has provided to alleviate pain and to aid nature in her work of restoration. It is no denial of faith to cooperate with God and to place themselves in the condition most favorable to recover. God has put in God has put it in our power to obtain a knowledge of the laws of, of life. This knowledge has been placed within our reach for use. We should employ every facility for the restoration of health, taking every advantage possible, working in harmony with nature's law. When we have prayed for the recovery of the sick, we can work with all the more energy, thanking God that we have the privilege of cooperating with Him. And as his blessing on the means which he himself has provided. So this is very important, as, as you can see there. And worthy of even me reading one more time through. But again, this is Ministry of Healing, page 231. One of the books that, I, as I say, we play here uh, in cycle at the four o'clock hour. Important reading, right? God gave you nature. God gave you a brain. God gave you understanding of the Bible, and we're still, not the Bible, sorry, understanding of the body. And we're still understanding how the body works. And as this information is revealed and as the old information is studied, you, you see, again, like a disease like coronavirus, and they say, well, what is it doing? It's attacking the lungs. It infects the lung, it affects the AC2 receptors. Maybe you can't get enough oxygen, you feel like you're breathing at 20%. You can see why it would complicate somebody with COPD and persons older, person with a weak immune system, or person smoke. So you say, well, what are the what are the solutions out there to protect the lungs, to help the lungs recover, and all that? And you go find those. Then you understand how the lungs work and all that, and you go find it. It doesn't mean that you don't pray. You still pray. And you go work. Remember, our faith is a faith that works. The mainline churches, they just have faith. They don't have no works. Because they believe if they work, they're, they're taking matters into their own hands. Here we believe different. We believe that nature has things in it to relieve pain and to help us to restore. The body's working to restore us. Inflammation and all those things are a process of the body trying to restore us to health. So you work with the body and you do the things necessary to stay alive because God made us to live even if we just have a short probation that God made us to live I read one more text before I start to talk about some of the things that we need to be doing to take care of yourself period for the current flu epidemic and for any corona or anything it's just the remedies are there and the processes are there we don't ignore them and just say oh I'm just going to have faith and I'm just going to claim Psalms 91 no we have faith and we work we pray and we work. We do what God has given us to do and then we work. Notice here in Isaiah 38 verse 18 through 21. Notice here, For the grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Here, this is Ezekiah talking and he's saying, Look, the grave can't praise thee. And the dead can't celebrate thee. I want to celebrate God. I want to celebrate God today and I want to celebrate him especially tomorrow. So I need to stay alive. I'm going to fight for life until I can't fight anymore. And then I leave that up to God, whatever that is. Until then, we're trying to stay alive here. And so he says, the grave cannot praise thee. Praise the Lord. I can't praise the Lord right now. I don't want to be able to praise the Lord. I want to always stay healthy. So I do the things that I know I need to do. Notice here, the living the living, he shall praise thee. As I do this day, the father to the children shall make known thy truth. Notice, truth is never removed from us. We are not the mainline churches who believe, oh, just have faith, no truth. We, we, we love truth because it's revealed to us and it's for us and our kids. Notice here, verse 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the string instrument all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. 
For Isaiah had said, Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. So you know, Ezekiah was sick as a king, and he was about to die, ask the Lord, for 15 more years. And what was the answer? The prophet says, Take a lump of fig, some, make a poultice, lay it on the boil. We don't know if it was a cancer or just a carbuncle or what it was, but he was going to die from it. He put it on there and he, he, he lived. So the Lord could just wipe his hand or just snap his hand or say, live. And he lived, but God said, use a natural remedy. So as my premise, you cannot close your mind to natural remedies and say you're walking with God. And you're just going to have faith. You go claim Psalms 91. You apply the natural remedies that God gives. So God's just saying, the miracle was in the natural remedies. Well, who made up natural remedies? Well, it's God. And God said, what do you need? The, the solution he need is if he put that on there, he has 15 more years. It's both supernatural and it's also natural. We use both. We depend on both. Um, notice again, why was Ezekiah talking like this? Because Isaiah told him, do this. And he like, praise the Lord. Pray, like, he said, man, the dead can't praise thee. And why is he saying that? Because Isaiah said, put a lump of fig. He said, thanks, Isaiah. Thanks, God. I'll read it again, verse 20. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we shall sing my songs on, to the string instrument all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. He said, I'm going to go back to church. I'm going to get above this bed. For Isaiah had said, let them make a lump of fig and lay it on for a plaster. We normally, in our modern time, we say a poultice upon the boil and he shall recover. And he started praising the Lord. So what is our lump of plaster if we're dealing with any type of influenza, any type of lung problem? Well, first thing to do real quickly here is my rundown. And you could listen to this again later on on the podcast. I'll post it to Revive Form Radio. Um, proper full spectrum whole foods, right? So our diet is to be a diet that is colorful, full spectrum, whole foods. Because in those whole foods, as I, exa- I explain, I give you an example in a few minutes, you have a spectrum of nutrients that will boost your body and build your body up, give you good blood. That's where you need good blood to fight diseases and to keep your body fed when you're going through a beatdown. Proper hygiene when you come on to sanitary practices, so proper hygiene is better to prevent ca- contracting something than to fight it. But if you do get it, that's where you keep listening to me for the next few minutes. So proper sanitary hygiene, very important. Keep hydrated, especially in the winter. It's difficult to keep hydrated in the winter when you're in northern countries because, you know, it's cold. You want to urinate less, but you have to keep hydrated. It is note that when you're of your saliva is very fluid and it's not very mucousy and thick. It's more difficult for cold and flu to get stuck there and start to grow. Fresh air, most naturally, difficult again in the winter. So I always believe in sleeping with my windows cracked and try to get as much fresh air as possible in the winter because fresh air is a healer. Uh, most things will burn off and die off because of oxygen. Exercise, again, important all year. Very important in the winter. Most, most of these viruses, they run amok when it's winter time. Um, salt, uh, sea salt especially, because salt has a lot of minerals. And you body need to have minerals in order for you to be healthy. Talk a little bit more about that in a second. Proper sleep, most naturally. Those are some of the things that you need to do. When a person is sick, what they want to do? They want to sleep. The body needs to repair. Uh, so you get your proper sleep. Anyhow, it's dark anyhow. So there's a compensating factor. Um, you know, and then you get your sunlight because why? It's hard to get sunlight in the winter because you want to stay in inside, right? So you get your proper sunlight. The sunlight will give you vitamin D. Vitamin D has been proven to limit your catching a virus in the winter and also um, it definitely limited in the summer and it helps you fight the, the disease. It boosts the immune system. Some foods in the winter to be important to partake of. Uh, in the winter, it's always important to partake of high amount of citrus. It just so happened that it's in the winter time that the Lord makes citrus be available. In the summertime, it's more watery fruits like melon, 
and the berries and stuff like that. But in the winter, it's the high citrus foods, uh, fruits, and then foods that are high in vitamin A, which is important for the immune system. So you eat according to what nature kicks out. The Lord kicking out for you a lot of citrus. You partake of a lot of citrus. The vitamin C content in citrus that is bioavailable is available easily for the body to use. Will You will find that it will boost your system and it will give you a stronger immunity in the winter. So eat with nature. As I said, nature gives you, as she said earlier, I read, nature is giving you a solution, partake of the solution. Um, apples and pears are very important. Apples and pears, um, as I say, apple a day literally because of the eye antioxidants will literally keep the doctor away. Now imagine if you can juice and drink 10 apples a day. Uh, I think you'll keep a lot of the bugs away. Um, apple also, one of the things I've been recently looking at as a high amount of quercetin. Quercetin makes zinc available to the body and zinc available to the cell because it allows cell, the, 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 the quercetin or um, quercetin takes the zinc into the cell. Well, what's going to happen there? When you have zinc in your cell, um, coronavirus does not live in a cell that has zinc because the zinc causes it to not replicate. Uh, so that has been clinically proven that zinc stop the replication of the coronavirus. That is something you can just type in zinc coronavirus. And you see the epidemiological studies and various different studies that have been peer reviewed showed that zinc will stop the replication of the coronavirus. Well, apple helps the zinc get into your body and make your body ingest more because it has high content of quercetin. So you use that. Um, also, tubers and things like garlic and onion are important to use. Uh, because they have high vitamin C. And another example, one of the highest content of quercetin is onions. Onions make the cell pull in. Um, when you eat onion, the nutrients from it, like quercetin, make the cell pull in certain nutrients and certain minerals into the cell to stop the replication, literally, of something like coronavirus. So high amount of garlic, high amount of onion, it's been proven. And if you think about it, if you're trying to fight against vampires, what do you do? You have a lot of garlic around you and onions, all right? <laughs> but I think that's why that myth came about. Because remember, that, that vampire concept came about from Europe when they were dying of the plague. Well, what would have helped them with the plague? Onions and garlics. When you have a cold, one of the things you do is you make what they call a nature's penicillin. What is a nature's penicillin? Lemon, um, lemon, orange, grapefruit, uh, garlic, onion, some cayenne pepper, blended together and drank down. That's going to give you citrate bifibronized, your vitamin C, your quercetin, your various different other compounds that will kill virus or stop them from replicate. This is what you do. And you drink that, you feel better. You say, how? Because it's real. Pumpkin, all these other things, these tubers have high amount of vitamin A, build up your body. Green leafy vegetables have basically almost all your nutrients you're going to need to be able to ward off or to have a powerful immune system. Green leaf and vegetables will have all the nutrients you need. I'm going to tell you the nutrients before we end here. Um, what type of herbs have? So these are the foods you need to eat in season. Now, I say in season because in season, you get high volume in the wintertime in the northern climates of citrus, apples, pears, tubers, garlics, onion, pumpkins. And then you get your leafy green vegetables that are tougher, kale, collard greens. That's what you need to be partaking of in the winter. You, uh, when I say partaking, I mean your splurge. You partake of them big time. Herbs to be taken, immune herbs like echinacea, pardark, inner bark. Um, something to take, olive, oil of oregano. Oil of oregano is like nature's bleach. You take it, you put it in your mouth, but you dilute it with some, like a teaspoon of olive, olive oil or sunflower oil, four drops of oil of oregano. And it has been shown that it clears out bacteria and viruses and stuff out of your mouth. So that means if you take something, because a lot of the, transmission of these diseases are into our nose or into our mouths. So you want to clear your mouth out, especially if you've been on the road, you've been around people and you've been inhaling their stuff. You just want to clear it out of your throat and mouth. Elderberry syrup, very important to have if you do get sick or before, if you feel like you're coming out with something. Anti-inflammatory herbs like turmeric and white willow bark, as I read what Ellen White talk about. To deal with pain, you want to take it down inflammation and you want to have something to deal with the pain. White willow bark is the forerunner of aspirin and it will help you with pain. It'll, like Jesus will take the pain away and also turmeric and uh, white willow bark will take the pain away. You pray to Jesus to take the pain away, 
and you use some turmeric, you use some white willow bark, you have a fate that works. Uh, long herbs like pleurisy and yarrow. Pleurisy is that sac that is around our lungs that causes us to be able to breathe and cause the lungs to move up and down. When you have something like a coronavirus, it gets swollen. If you have any type of influenza pneumonia, it gets swollen. So if it is swollen, you're not going to be able to have the freedom of breathing. Also, you're not going to, you're going to start catch, catching water in your lungs and stuff like that. And other things that's going on in the lungs, pleurisy would be one of the number one herbs. So that yarrow would be another number one herbs. There's other herbs like that that are important. So you get some herbs for the lungs. And you take that to try to relieve the pain. Because as I say, Jesus will take the pain away. But also, these herbs will take the pain away. Um, some of the main herbs, that some of the main vitamins that you can take naturally, as I say, through green leafy vegetables, or you can use them by just getting supplementation, natural, or any other way. When you're trying to ward off sickness, you do this. And these are especially important in the summer, but, um, sorry, in, in the winter. Uh, important all year long, but important in the winter. Vitamin A, as I said over and over again. Vitamin C, obviously. High dosage of this. Vitamin D, preferably D3. Um, it will D3 will help with the passive protection of the lungs. It will line the lungs, in the lining of the lungs to make sure the disease can get in. And then also it works in the active response of the vitamin, of the, the white blood cell. So you want to have this high amounts. And that's why people not putting it together, I think. In the winter, we have all these bugs killing us. And in the summer, they go away because in summer, we have more sun. We're outside getting fresh air. We, you know, we're eating melon and we have some hydration going and we're doing better. We have a lot of vitamin D. These um, diseases don't work well in the summer. In the winter, they do ma they do their magic. So you want to stop that magic. You want to get your vitamin D up. Zinc also will stop literally the replication of the coronavirus. You can go look at the research online. You'll see what I'm saying. And so you want to get your zinc up. And then you want to be able to get the zinc in the system by using a lot of like things like onions, apples, stuff like that to fill your system. Selenium, very good. You need to have food that is rich in selenium, like carrots that are organic, grown in the soil, and you up your selenium level. What that will do for you is that you will basically have a system that you know, a strong immune system. They have done studies and show that a person who has high levels of zinc in their system been clinically proven, high levels of zinc in major studies, um, that I think a study that came out last week, that showed that if you have high levels of zinc in your system and you're exposed to the flu influenza, that three out of four people that gets, that come in contact with the influenza virus will not even come down with the virus. It will not uh, uh, um, affect them at all. They get immunity. Three out of four. So that's just important. So if four of us in a room, four of us got contaminated with it and we have high levels of zinc. It's a possibility that three, they say the number is three, been proven three, will not even be affected by it, not touch them. And if you add vitamin D to that, vitamin C, vitamin A, the various different other things that I covered here, if you listen to it again, you, 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 you go in a position that is not, you not, might not be 100% but you'll be close there. Now, why am I saying this? Again, avoid being presumption. Preparation is not a denial of faith. If you prepare and something do come down, you're still prayed up. But if you didn't make no preparation, all you're doing is praying, and then you're really being presumptuous. This stuff is going to roll, and it's going to keep rolling, and it's going to keep taking up people. You don't want to be one of them. And so here, you could listen to me, and you could ignore what I'm saying. You could go and watch one of the major preachers telling you all you need to do is have faith in Psalm 91. And here I remind you, Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 through 6. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he do, it shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So our ways are the Lord's ways. We practice natural health. We follow natural principles. 
we are faithful to the word. We are faithful to prayer. We believe in the word. We believe in the prophecies. We believe in the natural remedies. We're not those that say, oh no, if it's not chemical, we don't use it. We believe that we use all available means that have been proven to be effective and as, uh, and as proven both traditionally and even through research to be protective, protective. And we use them. But that doesn't mean we don't believe that God can't deliver. It just means that we use what our brains are giving us to use. And what is divinely possible, we use that. So we don't stand in the seat of the, un or we don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We don't believe that natural remedies can't help you and protect you, protect you as a shield and a buckler. We believe it. But that's what the truth is, a shield and a buffer. And this is truth. So I hope that you walk in the counsel of the godly. And that's what I'm preaching here. Let us pray. Our Father, what in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of your word this day. And a blessing to your Lord that we don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We follow natural health message. We follow the biblical health message. We follow the principles that has been given to us over millennia about how to take care of our bodies and how to use the means available in nature to relieve suffering. May you bless us towards this. And may we be faithful to this and faithful to thee. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again live Monday morning where we should do a new theme. Until then, I pray that you may continue walk with the King. Thank you.